Okay, we've been hearing about a lot of problems and a lot of challenges, and you have sitting in front of you a problem solver. And, in, you know, I was thinking, I'm David Kirkpatrick, by the way, if uh, when Sandrine said that neoliberalism has failed, you know, one of the things that it really failed with is countries like Ghana, where Aloysius grew up at, on a farm. And, and here he is a guy who went to college in Kumasi and has created a, through a really amazing chain of, of events and, and energy and, and, and in enterprise and luck, a, a, a very successful growing business called Farmer Line, which is serving 2.2 million farmers in the developing world now and is growing rapidly and has a lot of interesting prospects. Um, so that's, that's what we want to understand is the, the success and the, the prospect for further impact. But, but it's really also a, a, a story of enterprise and how enterprise can target these problems like farmer income and, and combined with forest destruction, uh, which you help monitor and reduce and keep to a minimum. Why don't you just first describe what Farmer Line is? And don't forget to talk slowly. Okay, uh, talking slowly. All right, so very happy to be here. Uh, how many of you had coffee this morning? <laughs> All right, cool. If you had coffee this morning, there's a very high chance that uh, the coffee came from some of the farmers that we support in Africa. So specifically what we do, we run a digital marketplace for small scale farmers. And what we do is to train them digitally uh, leverage their data to finance them so they can get access to fertilizer, seeds, uh, help them to grow their food, and then we help them to sell it so they can make more money. The key is helping farmers to generate wealth so they can invest in their farms, invest in their communities, and have the opportunity to adopt more regenerative farming practices. Is that slow enough? No, that was good in terms of the pace, but continue, talk a little bit more about how you do that. What do you do for the farmers? Uh, three main things. The first thing is, all the practices that they need to adopt, we break it down into their local language. People want to learn in their local languages. People can adopt regenerative farming practices if they don't understand it. So we take all that, break it down into simple audio messages. So you can think of it like a podcast on a dumb phone, 60 second messages, helpline for farmers. Farmers can access information anytime, anywhere in their native language. The second thing is... So a lot of it is audio. Audio, yeah. Right, they make a phone call, and then they go through t phone trees effe effectively to get information on specific topics. Exactly, yeah. exactly. In their, in, in their language, right, because Ghana, for instance, we have 60 local languages. Nigeria has about 200. So it's really important that you give the information to the people in their local dialect. The second thing is get them access to high-quality fertilizer, seeds, and then machinery so they can grow food very well. Um, the biggest problem around that is that many farmers are not connected to the financial system. Many banks require them to bring collateral. So we created something like a FICO for farmers where we leverage their data, the farm data, to be able to finance them. Then when they grow the food, uh, which is the final part, we buy the food so they can make money. We sell some of it locally, and then we export the rest to China, Vietnam, India, and the rest of the world. Right, you actually export commodities to Vietnam, China, Turkey, et cetera, yeah. from, a, and list the countries in which you're operating now. Uh, well, we, our software has been deployed in 48 countries. I may not be able to list all of them. No, you don't have to list those, but where you that's your software business, yeah. which is a separate story we'll get to in a minute. Yeah. Just talk about where you're operating Farmer Line yourself. Uh, mostly in West Africa. So Ghana, Ivory Coast, uh, Togo, Bene, uh, you know, we are just expanding to East Africa as well, uh, Kenya and Tanzania. So, yeah, actually, one of the real innovations, it's really a finance innovation, is that you're not requiring farmers to put up collateral in order to borrow because you use digital means to assess their bankability yeah. uh, by measuring their output and such. And I think that's a key part of the success of Farmer Line. And you have a co founder who's even more technical than you. Um, but you really brought a digital mindset to the problems that you discovered growing up on your own family farm, right? Yeah. Talk a little bit about how you realized there was a problem that needed to be solved. Um, so, you know, grew up on the farm. 
Um, what were is, they growing on that farm? So mostly uh, maize, uh, cassava, which is very common, right? So if you grew up in Ghana, uh, and you don't grow up in the cities, there's a very high, high chance that you support, like, you know, your family is, is into farming and you support. Slow down. Huh? You go to school, yeah. like most people, on the weekends, you, you know, you go to farm and then support. So I've been seeing, like, challenges, are, like, in the farmer's face, you know, access to information, access to financing. Uh, and then when I went to college and I started learning about, like, farming in other parts of the world, you realize that all the problems that my family and people, like, the farmers I know were facing, they were solved, like, they were solved about, you know, 100 years ago but they just didn't have access to it just because of where they stay, where they live. Uh, you know, they live in rural areas, poor road networks, uh, you know, no access to internet. So we decided to do something about it, like build um, technology, uh, you know, leverage technology that farmers already use and then help them to get access to products and services that we know helps farmers to grow more food and make more money. That's so cool. And you know, another thing that's interesting was once he learned how to use a computer, he immediately understood how to look for resources all over the world. So within like a year, maybe it was your first year or so, he got a State Department grant for 3,000 bucks, right? Yeah. That was one of the first things that happened. So the U.S. State Department almost seeded this company. But then uh, Echoing Green, Skoll, each one introduced them to the next. Finally. He got an Echoing Green Prize, and then somebody from Hershey, I'm just telling this quickly, somebody from Hershey approached him, and he has become essentially a, a partner with Hershey and a number of other global food companies. Um, and I wanted to explore that in a minute, but what I was leading up to was say that he finally met Acumen at the Skoll Foundation annual summit in Cambridge, and Acumen has been really the catalytic capital that allowed this company to come into existence and has not only given them three million dollars a number of years ago, but essentially continued to assist you even to this day, right? Yeah. yeah. Talk about that a little bit. And then I want to talk about the partnership with the companies. Yeah, of course. I think the main story is that like when you give people access to opportunities, good things happen. Good things happen not just only for them, but also for their community, right? So we started I started my business with my co-founder with six hundred dollars. Uh, from a boot camp uh, about 10 years ago. Who started, who ran that, where did the boot camp come from? Uh, you know, Setin Bennis Lee. He, Tim Berners Lee uh, uh, boot camp company, you know, the Web Foundation had a boot camp in Ghana. That's yeah. what really got him started. Yeah, exactly, right? So, um, access to information, access to opportunities, you know, we just, you know, capitalized on that, right? So, we built a platform that, that helped farmers. Um, we started like, you know, sharing the information around and people started helping us, right? So we got, you know, $600 and then we got like 5,000 pounds. At the time, it was a lot of money, 5,000 pounds from a UK uh, NGO, um, Which then uh, Indigo Trust Indigo in the Trust, UK. Yeah. Uh, and then... Uh, 5,000 pounds, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it was critical. Yeah. And uh, in 2014, Equine Green, one of the best fellowships in the world, like they support social entrepreneurs like Michelle Obama, uh, Van Jones, they, they selected us um, and they gave us $90,000 to invest into our company and build it. Uh, and that changed everything, actually. Um, it changed everything. It gave us more access, more opportunity. Many people want to work with us. When we meet people and we talk to them, people focus on the essence of what we do and they want to get in. You don't have to, like, you know, we didn't have to justify what we're doing, uh, people just, you know, ask questions and go straight to it. And that's what happens when you give people access. When you give people, you know, when you, when you teach people how to fish, um, you know, they fish and then they help their communities. And that's what happened when we joined Queen Green. What do you think, I, I, I want to get to the companies in a second, but what do you think the farmers are getting from you that they didn't have before? Um, what farmers are getting I mean, from you? I mean, like they're getting finance, but it's like, there's, there's sort of a sense of support that, that, and, and connection to the world, right? Yeah, support, connection to the world, community, uh, dignity, you know, like farmers want to create wealth. They just don't want to survive. You know, when people think about small scale farmers, people think about, oh, these are really, really poor, feeble, helpless people. They work really hard. They're extremely intelligent. They know their role in the global food system because they feed one third of humanity and they will continue feeding the world. Right, so they work really hard. Um, uh, sorry, I lost my chain of thought. No, no, that's good. You're just talking about the psychology of the farmers, right? And yeah. what they benefit from by being connected to a network like yours. Yeah, exactly, right. So, yeah, so, yeah. so you know, access to information, uh, you know, in their native language, 
um, drives adoption. Like, when we build a technology, when people get phone calls from us in their native language, there's a lot of joy, right? Like, farmers are, like, they actually wait for calls from us. They wait for us to send them messages. And what they see is they see themselves in the information and they trust it and they use it. Uh, before us, they were not getting access to that because they, you know, they are not online, they don't have access to internet, they don't use smartphones. So taking all that, bundling it into their native language and giving it to them allows them to adopt best farm management practices, allow them to get access to market prices globally so they know how much their food is being sold so they can make more money. Right. So essentially, um, granting them access to information um, and services that help them to create wealth. And you also have people on the ground that are contractors, agents that really go to the farms, yeah. and, and they get a little compensation from you, and they're sort of your eyes and ears in the field in addition to the telephone connection to the farmers. Exactly. They're, you know, when you work with small-scale farmers, the currency is trust. Uh, tech alone cannot solve everything. You need human beings to work with you to get to the farmers. Because farmers want to see a face in their local community, a face that they can trust. So we built a network of 3,000 uh, local agribusinesses and micro-entrepreneurs. Um, we think that supporting farmers to grow food is a team sport. Uh, you know, it's not a winner-take-all. So you got to embrace everyone into the, into the chain and find a win-win solution. So when they help us to distribute products and services and then buy crops from farmers, they also create businesses that help them and their family as well. And that's been the approach. Uh, work with others, work through others to create wealth for farmers. Well, talk about then meeting Hershey, what Hershey d asked you to do, and how that has developed into a, a set of networks with big corporations. Uh, about seven years ago, we met the sustainability representative of Hershey in, in West Africa. And they had a platform at the time called Coco Link, which was basically a platform that gave information to farmers using SMS. They wanted to change, they, you know, they wanted to upgrade that to voice. And they want, also wanted to build um, for the, you know, the younger generation, the smartphone empowered generation. So we built a platform for them uh, called uh, still Coco Link. Um, Coco uh, Link. Coco yeah. Link. Uh, it has a chat bot in it that gives information to people uh, like, you know, on demand. Um, it, it, you know, it also helps their farmers in their network to also access information in their native language as well. Um, and finally, they leverage our platform to track and monitor activities in their supply chain. And that has been happening for the past uh, seven years. We, we work with them now in Ghana and also Ivory Coast. And, but there are a number of big food companies that you work with now. What's the nature of that work? So many food companies make a lot of promises. They, they want to get things, many things done by 2030. A lot of those promises are around reducing scope three emissions in the supply chain. A lot of them are still try, trying to figure out the how. So specifically, how, what we do is that we help them to monitor about 280 million acres of nationally protected forest in Ghana, Ivory Coast, Nigeria, Peru, and Ecuador. Um, and then we also help them monitor 3.1 million acres of small farms in their network. Basically what that does is that they're able to track deforestation and they're able to halt it using our technology. When they track, when they halt, they also leverage our services as well to help those farmers, educate the farmers, finance them so they can grow more food, high quality food. Um, in a, like, you know, at the end of the day, it's a win-win. Hershey or the food companies buy more food, more quality food. Farmers make more money. Everyone wins. The world gets fed, and we all have great coffee to drink. What are some of the other companies beside Hershey you work with? Uh, ETG, uh, in a trading company. Uh, Barry, uh, you know, one of the largest B2B chocolate manufacturers in the world. Um, Touton, a French company. Um, yeah, like, you know. A lot more, yeah. But it's pretty, you know, so what, what you've sort of discovered is that there's a whole ecosystem that has to be sort of brought together to, to improve the lot of the farmers in, in the final analysis, right? And, and that seems to be sort of how you've evolved the company into being almost like an ecosystem manager, right? So you have this thing called Mission 13. Just quickly describe what that is, because that's sort of an aspirational new part of your work, even as you are trying to serve many, many more farmers. Yeah, uh, we, we support 2.2 million farmers. There are 500 million farmers in the world. I don't know of any organization that is supporting at least 10 million farmers actively. That is a big problem because, you know, 70% of the food that we eat comes from small-scale farmers. So we need to be able to, um, you know, support these uh, um, small-scale farmers um, so that they can grow more food. 
So the way we think about this is that going forward, we want to be able to co <clears throat> collaborate with governments, large food companies, uh, um, you know, in fertilizer manufacturers, anyone that cares NGOs. about NGOs, anyone that cares about putting farmers at the center and giving farmers all that they need. We want to collaborate with them because our, our model is partnership, collaboration, um, team sport. So we want to work with people to do three main things. Let's get farmers all the information that they need, about 15 million farmers by 2030. Let's give them more financing, right? Because when you look at the global loss and damage, it's about 400 billion a year. Uh, from COP, we just, like, you know, they just set up a fund about 7 million. We want to be able to work with like, financial institutions and partners to give at least $3 billion to small-scale farmers. So to that help them pay them the re re compensation for the loss and damage for droughts and things like that, right? Actually, it's a business like opportunity. Yeah. Helping people to adapt to the impact of climate change. Adaptation. It's, yeah. not, just, it's not charity. It's smart business. Right. Period. Right. right? So invest in that because it's a great business opportunity. It helps to strengthen like, you know, supply chains. And then finally, also mitigating the impact of climate change as well. So that's our goal. Work with everyone get, to get farmers training, get farmers the financing, help them to grow more food sustainably to feed the future, but then also to make more money. And why do you call it Mission 13? Uh, I'm a huge fan of Lewis Hamilton, so he has a foundation called Mission 44. And the 13 comes from, uh, you know, the 13th SDG, climate. So 13th Mission 13. SDG. Yeah. He's an SDG-centric <laughs> business. One thing I'm curious if you've thought about or, you know, if you look at the climate crisis, the big picture, and what's going wrong, and it's so much, but one of the most worrisome things is the, the, the intersection between climate-driven migration, political change in developing, developed countries, and the rise of autocracy that the xenophobia leads to, et cetera, and obviously one of the world's biggest challenges is helping the world's poor thrive where they are so they don't have to migrate. Is that something you think about that you're trying to address at least indirectly? Yeah, 100%. You know, 60% of the world's arable land is in Africa. Africa is the youngest population. So we have all the ingredients uh, to be a major broker. Like, you know, when, when, when people think about Africa and agriculture, they, people often think of charity, philanthropy, which is all good. But going forward, there's a massive business opportunity for everyone. So the way we think about it is like, when you give people opportunity, just like how I got opportunity and access, they will create, they will develop their like, communities, they will create wealth, because they love, I love to stay in my house, my home in Ghana. I love to enjoy my country. So if everything is there, when there is access, there's no need for me to, like, you know, there's no need for people to leave their country. They can stay back home. So when jobs, like, you know, when you train farmers, give them financing, jobs are created. Uh, by 2030, we aim to create about you know, 15 million jobs um, for small-scale farmers, and uh, hopefully that creates wealth. And you know, there will not be any need for people to uh, you know, leave their countries or like, you know, their communities and go to elsewhere. It's amazing the range of impact you can have when you build a business like yours, but it's very complicated. Yeah. And you, you've addressed, you've really begun to grapple with a lot of the complications. So you're trying now probably to raise some more money and in order to do that extent from 2.2 2 million to 15 million farmers, yeah. which I suspect you will succeed at. But if anybody here has ways to support this guy, he's doing extremely good work and really having the impact that we've heard other panels describe is needed. He's doing it. So thank you, Aloysius. Thank you, David. Thank you. Yeah.